Well, hi, my name is Ken and you're watching Mastering UX. Uh, in this episode, I wanted to cover a little bit of a different topic, and that is getting into the matter of organizations and the dynamics of working within a UX organization. You know, um, I think that UX actually has a lot of reputation for causing a little bit of drama, both uh, with other organiz other uh, departments in companies, and UX can also have a reputation with having infighting within, um, within the department. Um, so the title of this uh, episode is going to be Can UX Get Along? Um, so the, I'd like to leave you, start you off with this quote, and it's coming together is a beginning, keeping together is progress, and working together is success. And this quote comes from Henry Ford, an American, American industrialist. Um, so what I wanted to do is I wanted to cover this topic by giving you um, a little presentation of four personas that I kind of created, and they're based upon things that I've seen over the course of my career. And my hope is, is by looking at this um, dynamics between different types of UX um, personas and a product owner, that you would come away with an empathetic um, feeling about how you should be able to adjust your working style in a way that not only is compromising, but that would work towards the goal of producing better results for both uh, the UX goals and for the project team's goals. So the first persona that I wanted to present to you was Dina, the UX director. The next one is Gary, the UX generalist. Uh, the third is Spencer, the UX specialist. And the fourth is Paul, the product owner. So um, something that I wanted to kind of create as a theme is this, um, I believe this balance and some of the inspiration from this episode is based upon a, a book and it's called Org for the Design Org. And in that book, you know, he presents this concept of there's always this struggle between having the centralized UX department that kind of sends people out to do work and it's kind of centrally allocated on who would do what and there's no one that's dedicated and then having the other extreme of having generalists that do kind of work as a island within kind of embedded into the team and so there's kind of pros and cons of both and he kind of presents this idea that you really want to be able to have a balance between the two styles Okay, so with that in mind, let me go ahead and uh, introduce to you these personas. Um, the first one is Dina, the UX director. So Dina, she's got um, goals that I think there's nothing wrong with these goals. She wants to grow her UX department from 35 to 60. She wants to attract top talent. And of course, attracting talent is not easy, especially in this day and age. And so she needs to be able to have... Um, an elevation of the uh, importance of design within the organization. And she also realizes that it's very important for have a great design culture. Um, she wants efficiencies and consistencies um, across the different project teams. She wants to make sure that the work she's putting forth has a chance of being recognized for being well-known, for being consistent, for holding down the brand, for holding down standards. And, um, she wants to make sure that when people look at her work, everything has the same kind of feeling that there's one kind of steward over all the different parts of, of the digital presence within the organization. Um, and so with this, she's kind of looking to add more specialties. Um, the next persona is Gary, the UX generalist, or the, and this person's a lead within a project. And this person enjoys autonomy. This person does enjoy working with other UX teammates, likes to be able to, you know, talk to somebody, go to their cube, get some ideas. But, um, you know, um, Gary, the UX lead, you know, also feels that it can be sort of a burden when there's too many opinions, too many minds that are working on a project. So sometimes Gary's had some frustrations around other UX designers being sent to his project and them not understanding fully the goals of the project and kind of bringing in all kinds of different uh, ways and um, not only methods, but also philosophies on the design. 
Um, so, uh, Gary is somebody that, uh, likes to, likes being point on his prod on his project. But one of the negative things that he feels is that, um, it, it's hard for him to learn new skills, being kind of dedicated to one, one product or two products. And Gary does wish that he could work on more projects. Okay. The next, uh, UX, uh, persona I'd like to present to you is Spencer, the UX specialist. And, um, so Spencer is somebody that likes to be very prepared, likes to be very methodical, wants to be able to kind of build this foundation of knowledge or whatever asset that they're trying to work on and, um, be able to really have something that's really well thought out, really methodical, and then be able to present all the work that they've done, um, towards, towards, towards the end. Um, uh, the final thing is, is that, you know, Spencer likes to make sure that, um, everything is kind of buttoned up. And so I don't know if you're already beginning to feel there could be a little bit of conflict between what Gary wants and what Spencer wants. Is any one of these uh, personas wrong? I, I really don't feel so. Um, and then finally, there's the product owner. So the product owner obviously is not on the UX team. Um, the product owner prefers to have a dedicated UX resource, um, definitely appreciates good design, appreciates good execution, appreciates great ideas. But, you know, definitely Paul wants to make sure things are uh, within uh, the time budgets and um, monetary budgets. Um, Paul... Um, you know, has a challenge of needing to coordinate with a lot of different departments. And also Paul needs to coordinate with a lot of different personality types and um, different kind of skill sets within his team. And that's not easy. And because Paul's having to juggle so many different kind of um, wants and needs and please so many people, um, sometimes Paul finds it difficult to work with UX. And even Gary can be a problem for Paul because sometimes Gary is, you know, trying to fight for the best user experience. And Paul really, you know, wants a little bit of compromise. Um, Paul's not against UX, but Paul wants to make sure that, um, if there's any kind of research, there's any kind of exploration, any concept work that's being done by UX, it's fine as long as it doesn't interfere with the current work. So those are the kind of the four personas that I wanted to present to you. And then I wanted to kind of come back and say, you know, you have this dynamic and what Dina wants is to grow that department. And to grow that department, she's going to have to realize that um, there's a balance between making sure that the product teams are happy. If the product teams can't be productive, if they don't feel that UX is an asset, then they're not going to want to fund UX projects. Um, but, um, I, you know, Dina does have this point that she wants to make sure that not only one project team is happy in isolation, she's trying to make sure that the products are consistent across. She's got an oversight. She's got responsibilities to make sure she's being a steward of the brand and consistencies and uh, style guides. So she has a lot to look over. So she's got to kind of maintain this balance between keeping the project teams happy and kind of having this global oversight and also being able to have sort of um, a discipline that UX has to offer. Um, and so what I would say to Dina is that she's going to want to make sure that she's, she's going to want to try to work out win-win solutions where um, UX can really have the best of both worlds, where there is some kind of person dedicated to the project teams to make those project teams happy, but she's able to have sort of another set of specialists to come into those project teams, su supplement, augment the skill sets, kind of add a little bit more discipline and certain things such as the design system, research, design thinking, um, and also begin to mature the organization into deeper UX processes. Um, but while she's doing this, she's going to have to make sure she does it in a skillful way that um, that's not affecting the current project works, not causing projects to go over budget, but you know, in theory, all the things that she's doing should be adding efficiencies to um, to to the UX process. Okay, so let's go to uh, Gary, the UX generalist. So um, Gary, you know, is a person that um, that definitely, um, you know, has has 
has pros and cons that they feel about the specialists. They have a love-hate relationship with the product, mostly a love. They, they really like being that kind of point person, having kind of being the person that can make the calls on the UX team. But Gary is going to need to be a person that's going to need to respect and honor that there's, there's some specialties that really have some skills to offer that Gary isn't quite a senior in. And so he's got the opportunity to learn from those people. But what Gary's going to want to do is make sure that he is really collaborating with these people about how do you phase and work with these specialists in a way that doesn't affect the project. Um, my recommendation is, is to work out a dual track agile method where Gary builds up enough lead time on the current um, sprints that, 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 that he's working on. At the same time, being able to work out another train of re research or you know conceptual designs and working ahead so that Gary can be thinking about the next big thing and to make sure that um, Gary has not got his head um, too tactical in kind of day-to-day -day execution weeds um, for Spencer um, Spencer's going to want to make sure that um, he's being very empathetic to the team that um, he realizes that the team's got deadlines. So if he's chomping at the bit, not having enough work to do, either he could start to look at other project work and kind of... Um, um, learn from those and being able to lend a helping hand. The other thing that Spencer can do is um, kind of work with Gary to make sure that he is finding that opportunity. And so the first preliminary research that he's doing, maybe on the current track of Agile, is going to be work that um, isn't ambitious to try to change the current work so much, but rather to start beginning that research on current things to make small incremental tweaks to that project to be helpful in a way that isn't disruptive. And, um, and then Gary, um, sorry, Spencer is going to want to, um, then be able to kind of figure out how he can be in the second uh, kind of track of Agile, work ahead, and kind of collaborate with Gary on some things that are sort of some research that are some deeper foundational things that need to be discovered and things that need to be found, and, and realizes that Gary is a wealth of knowledge because Gary's built up a lot of ideas, you know, ha having spent time with the product team, the product owner. And then finally, for Paul, the product owner, you know, I, I would say the advice that I would give for Paul is to just be very clear about um, what you want out of UX. Of course, um, Paul has a respect for UX work, but Paul wants to make sure it doesn't affect current timelines and it's not... Um, becoming too disruptive. And so, uh, Paul, uh, my advice would be is at, towards the beginning of projects, um, is to communicate clearly that there's certain times where UX can flex more, um, sort of exploratory work, discovering type of things that UX likes to spend more time on, and then give the forewarning that there's going to be certain times where they're going to be needing to be heads down, executing, there's not going to be a lot of changes. And during those times, it's okay for UX to kind of do a sideline of research or um, kind of uh, preparing things in the way of visual design, design, um, working on a design system. But again, to do it in a way that um, lets the current agile track uh, work rapidly and also um, you know gives them the kind of the room to have opportunities and time slots for UX to be able to do the discovering and exploratory work that they would like to do. So there you have it. I kind of presented these four personas. Um, you know, you may feel that these personas are realistic or they're not realistic. Um, hopefully, you know, this gives you an idea of some of the dynamics that happen within UX. And but I, the, the the main point that I wanted to to draw your attention to is this kind of friction between taking care of current uh, business needs with also UX's desire to kind of be, able, be the ones that are thinking bigger, that are really being the steward for the, the customer and to be, you know, thinking even a couple steps ahead of even the product owner in some regards um, and having a balance between these two and then finding ways where both can be achieved. And so I think if you're mindful of these kind of two goals of UX, um, it'll be very helpful for whatever persona that you are. 
So I'm going to try to produce another video um, along this line of kind of UX organization and the dynamics of the people aspect uh, of working in UX. So uh, thanks for sticking with me. Um, if you like this video, please uh, uh, give it a like. And if you uh, like this channel, please subscribe to it. It would definitely help me out. Um, so just want to thank you again. Um, I'll see you on the next episode.